name is Carrie Polero, and I've had multiple abortions uh, throughout my life. Um, I don't remember them past six. Um, the one that sticks out the most to me is the first one. Um, I had an abortion at 14 years old. Um, it was presented to me by my mother of, Hey, this is what we're going to do. And, um, I didn't really feel like I was able to use my voice. Um, and not that I would have chosen any different, um, but that just, I think added to the state of mind that I was in where at that point, um, you know, I hadn't, I didn't feel good about myself. I always felt like I wasn't good enough and I didn't measure up. And, um, I always wanted that, like that attention. My dad was never around. He was always out running around doing his own thing. And I always wanted that attention from a man. And so of course I was seeking attention from a man, um, ended up getting pregnant. And, um, at that point, oh my God, I don't even know what to do. Um, my mother suggested, Hey, let's, you know, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have an abortion because you don't know everything that's involved in taking care of a child. So, um, although I completely agree with her and, you know, I look back now and say, I'm so grateful for the decision that was made because she was absolutely right. Um, I didn't know what was, you know, going to be, I didn't know what it entailed. Uh, I didn't know what was happening to take care of a child because I was a child. And, um, I remember going to the facility and, um, and I say facility, I remember going to the women's clinic and I was sitting in this room of, and I was the youngest person there. There were all of these, um, older women and I say older, I mean, I was 14. So, I mean, to me, you know, 18, 19, 20, that was older for me. So we were in this, uh, I'm in this waiting room with all of these women and, um, they're just like pumping them in and out. And I remember, um, it, it just seemed like kind of cold and it wasn't, nobody was happy. It was like, everybody there didn't want to be there. So the energy in the room was, I don't want to say negative, but it was just heavy. It was really heavy. Um, I remember going back into a room where they, briefly explain the procedure to me, but nothing to what, um, what I thought. And I remember, um, they told me they would, um, I think they gave me like a Valium or something like that to, to kind of make me relax, but it didn't really matter because I was so nervous and I was so anxious because I didn't know what to expect. And the procedure was pretty painful. I remember it being painful. I remember um, the nurse that I dealt with wasn't very, wasn't very nice. And in fact, um, I want to say she had showed me the um, whatever, like the container or whatnot that they, that they had to feed us in when, um, when I was finished, I was really groggy. I don't, that that's the part that kind of blurs out a little bit, but I do remember specifically seeing that because that's the abortion that I remember the most for that reason. It was probably most traumatic for me. Um, after that, we went home and it was never discussed again. Um, it was kept a secret. And for me, um, then that's when like feelings started to flow in of, um, I couldn't identify that. Like I, I, something wasn't feeling right inside. Like I didn't feel good enough before, but now I felt like I was a bad person and I didn't deserve to be around. I didn't deserve to live. Um, and so those were the feelings that were, that were happening. I didn't seek therapy. I didn't think, um, I needed to, cause I didn't know any better. Um, but, you know, I remember coming home and, just kind of like laying around the house for a few days and it just kind of processing like what had, what had really just happened? What did I, what did I just do? Um, and then the, the feelings just started to flow in of, and it's more than just the feelings of the, you're not good enough or you're a bad person. 
what, why those were occurring was also because of how I grew up in a religious background where like, if you had sex before marriage, you were considered bad. And so all of those things were starting to go through my head. And when those started to go through my head, it was more of um, shaming myself. Like, cause now I'm like, no man will ever want me. I'm going to be alone forever. Um, I'm tainted, you know, all of those things. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think, um, because she kept it a secret from everyone and from my dad and from everybody. And so, um, I think that that on top of the being programmed as a child, you know, with like all of the religious beliefs that your that the family that the family believes in, um, though you kind of adopt those beliefs because you just, you just do, you, you learn from your parents and then you just repeat those things. So you don't know to challenge any of the beliefs at all. So you just kind of adopt them and move forward. And those really, and they can be so harmful. It's like, I never really thought about it until recently, how adopting those beliefs, um, really did harm me in the way that I felt about myself and the way that I looked at myself and then began to look at my body because then I started to be ashamed of my body after that physically. After my abortion, I, um, I kept it to myself and I didn't share it with anybody because I was told we were keeping it a secret. And so I was afraid to talk about it because also in my, I'm 14, I care about what everybody thinks at 14, right? I don't want anyone to think bad about me. So because of that, that also um, pay, that contributed to me keeping it a secret and continuing on the path of shame. Before, when I found out I was pregnant, I was like, in shock because I, I was like, what the hell am I going to do in this situation? Um, I let it drag out for a little bit. I told my mom's friend, um, because I trusted her and, um, I told her I, because I just didn't know what to do at that point, but I, I, I had committed that I was going to tell her myself, but it didn't turn out that way because I kept putting it off because the fear kept setting in. And the fear, the fear was growing and growing. And so finally it got to the point where her friend said, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell her because something needs to be said as far as if you are, whatever decision you guys are going to make, we don't want it to get too late before you can make a decision, you know? So she, I never told my mom, um, her friend told her, told her, and that was just kind of how it went. And, um, yeah. I mean, I'm grateful. I'm, I'm really grateful. Somebody stepped in because I was so afraid who knows I would have maybe dragged it out as long as I could. I, um, I never talked about the abortion really to anybody for a very long, long time, because again, it was kept a secret. And so, you know, I didn't understand that, you know, when you keep something a secret, it's, um, it grows in the dark. <laughs> Right. And so the secret kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was like over my shoulder the whole time. And I never talked about it at all. You know, things, I started to feel those feelings and emotions, but I, I didn't identify what was really happening. Um, but what I did learn in that moment when I was 14 was that abortion was birth control. And so that's how I began to live my life. And, um, and that's why I don't remember how many abortions that I've had. So I, because I treated it like birth control, um, the second time I was pregnant, um, I was like, it, cause it was kind of like a get out of jail free card when I was 14, like, Oh, this just solved the problem. This was quick. And, and in my mind, I was like, this was quick and painless and simple, easy solution always want to go the easier, softer way, but was it really easy? Because the, you know, the mental anguish and, um, you know, the feelings and the emotions that are attached to it that stayed with me for so many years, was it really easy? Or was that the lie I was telling myself, you know? So, um, the second abortion, um, it was easy for me to make that decision because I was at a point in my life where I went, Oh, I'm incapable of taking care of me. So what makes me think that I can take care of someone else? Just like before I was incapable of taking me care of me because I was 14. Now I'm older 
and I'm going, oh, I'm incapable of taking care of me. Um, let me go ahead and make this decision here because it's the quick, easy, painless way. And um, from there, I'll um, get, like, I wasn't, I still wasn't correlating the fact that this was just going to add to the shame. The shame was going to continue to grow in the dark. So I thought I was making a good decision on my part, but little did I know the feelings started to resurface. And at this point I had been using drugs because I, um, it, because I wanted to mask the feelings. So as I went through my life and I had multiple abortions, I really, um, I didn't really talk about them to anybody. I continued to keep everything a secret. Um, and then I continued to mask all the feelings that were coming up with drugs and alcohol. So like I could look back now and totally see that. Um, the one of the abortions that really stands out to me was um, I had broken up with a boyfriend and moved in with a guy like right away and ended up getting pregnant. And um, I was like, oh my God, I can't, I definitely can't do this. So I decided to have an abortion and I didn't want to do the surgical procedure because um, for some reason during that period, I kept thinking that it was going to be painful and um, you know, I create stories along the way, right? And because now I've introduced drugs and alcohol into the mix. So I, I'm beginning to like write stories that really don't exist. And I, and I kept saying to myself that it was going to be painful and I'm just going to go take this pill. This pill is going to solve all my problems. So I didn't do any research on this pill. And um, I went to the, the doctor's office and it was nice and calm and people were, um, you know, not, it wasn't negative energy. It's like everybody was there because they wanted to be there. And, you know, honestly, I'm thinking everybody's probably just excited to get this pill and not have to have this damn surgical procedure. Um, so I, I took my pills and I saw the doctor and I went home and I mean, it was so simple. And then I took the pills and went home. And that was like, that was the worst pain I have ever had in my entire life. I would not wish that on anyone. And, um, and that's, I think that's why that one sticks out for me so much because it was so painful. Um, like I remember laying on the floor, propping my feet up on the bed because I just couldn't, I couldn't stand up. I couldn't stand up. Um, I was up for like two or three days. It was that painful. Um, and I remember deciding, that I would never, ever do that again. And in fact, if I look back now, and if that was how the first one was, I don't think, I think I would have probably um, shifted my behavior. I wouldn't have thought uh, abortion is birth control, right? It's like if it was, that was my experience for the first one, but because it came so later in life, um, I just, the, the decision was made, oh, I won't be doing this again. I'll, I'll go back to the thing that I know the most. Right. So I'm still like correlating that this is still the problem. This all this, this is still the solution to the problem. Right. I'm still not even recognizing that, Hey, perhaps you should take responsibility for your behavior. Yeah. Um, when I was 38, um, I decided to go into recovery and get clean from drugs and alcohol. And um, when I did that, I was able to go back and look at um, my past behaviors when it came to abortion and why um, I looked at it the way that I did. And, um, you know, and I'm not going to say that I regret any of the decisions I made because I believe every single abortion was supposed to happen. Um, it was all part of my process, but do I look at, do I look at things differently today? Um, yes. As far as I would, um, as far as like the, ther the therapy or, um, talking about it instead of keeping it a secret, because I think shame is just so huge. Um, it's such a problem when it comes to, everybody, I'm not even going to just say women, it's to everybody, because when we feel shame, especially surrounding our bodies, we, um, it holds us back in life. And I don't even, I don't even realize that it's holding me back in life. But if I look back in my life today, I see that I didn't try to do anything because I felt like I didn't measure up. 
Um, when I was in a group of people, I wasn't smart enough to contribute. I didn't measure up. Um, I was less than. And so I never um, really participated in my life. I never showed up for my life because I didn't feel like I was worth anything because of the decisions that I had made. Had I made the same exact decisions and spoke about it, I think I, I would have felt much different. Um, but I see how keeping things a secret can definitely, you know, play, it plays a huge role in the way that you feel about yourself because shame just grows in the dark, but it dies in the light of exposure. So when I talk about it, then it's like, okay, I, I I'm talking about it. I'm putting it out there and I'm not carrying that heaviness around. No. And you know what? I don't even know that we've even discussed my mother and I have even discussed it. Um, she, I know I talk about it on social media all the time. And, um, she says that she's very proud of me for speaking out, but she, um, but we still don't even talk. We don't really even talk about it. It's, it's really interesting that you even asked me that because, um, because yeah, that might be something that I want to do to just like address with her, to let her know, really to let her know, because I talk about it so much that I don't blame her. That, that ultimately, regardless of anything, she she made the decision she thought was appropriate at the time. And I, you know, stand behind that 100%, you know. So um, there were so many feelings surrounding the abortion. Like, then, like I said, I masked them because I didn't want to feel them and I tried to avoid them. But um, the, the biggest thing was like self-loathing and hating myself. Um, I really hated my body. Um, there was like this feeling of, and it kind of like impending doom, kind of like I am doomed to um, this terrible life and I deserve any, I deserve everything bad that happens to me because I'm a bad person for making this decision. Um, it was all of those types of thoughts that kept going going through my head. And of course I feed that because I don't know that, um, when I'm younger, I don't recognize that I actually have control of those thoughts and that I can rewrite them. And so, because they're just constantly flowing through, I feed them and I, they get worse. And then I start to pick every little thing apart. Everything's wrong with me. Um, I, you know, I don't think that I deserve to be on the planet. I don't think that I can contribute to society. And then I begin to view the world as like a hostile environment. Like everybody's out to get me because I am this terrible person. If, if only they knew who I was, they would have nothing to do with me. Um, I shared all of the pregnancies with the partners that I was, that I was with, um, but I don't think any of them really played a big role in my life. Um, so in my mind, their opinion really didn't mean shit. It was about what I wanted to do. And, um, and I was all, I wanted to maintain this level of control because I was feeling so bad about myself. If I had control of the situation, then I felt like I had some sort of power um, and then I didn't feel as helpless and hopeless as I was feeling. So, yeah, um, I didn't really like they knew about it, but they also knew that this was going to be the decision I, that I made. And we didn't really, you know, it was never really discussed. My last abortion, I want to say was in my late twenties or early thirties. I can't remember, uh, again, drugs and alcohol, a lot of the years have blurred together. Um, and so it's, I'm 44 now, so it's been quite a few years. Um, and does it resurface? Yeah, it does. And, you know, now I know what to do with the feelings when they resurface, but what's recently resurfaced and I'm talking over the last seven days was I was feeling some kind of way about my body. Um, I was ashamed of my body and I was like, where is this coming from? Why am I ashamed of my body? Like I've worked through all of this stuff. And, um, what came up for me was a, re a relationship that I had my last relationship that I was in. He had made comments to me about the fact that I could no longer have children. 
um, because that is a consequence of having all of the abortions was the fact that I was, um, I had done enough damage to my body that I was not going to be able to have children. And I had tried, but I would, I had miscarried several times. And so I finally was like, okay, I'm in acceptance of this. Um, but when um, that came up for me this week of the shaming my body and then realizing, oh, this came from him constantly making comments. And then, and then immediately I was able to go, okay, cool. Like I have not allowed myself to feel those feelings. I put a wall up and I was like impenetrable. Like you could not, um, you couldn't get through to me because I needed, that was my survival skill in that relationship. So, um, yeah, I, uh, gave myself 15 minutes and cried that shit out and like, like journaled about it. And I was able to like, let it go. And that's kind of like what I do today, you know, rather than sit in that shame, cause I can sit there and, and then what does that do? And then I just perpetuate the cycle all over again. Now, when these feelings come up, um, now that I know what to do when, when I have the feelings that come up as far as, um, the room, that little voice that tells you, remember who you really are. Remember all those decisions that you made, all those abortions that you had, you're really not a good person. You know, and I coach women today. So it's like, um, I've had the experience before where I've laid, um, on the couch for two weeks and not moved or laid in bed for two weeks and fallen into like this depression. Um, and I know that that's not the solution today because I, if I go there, then I can stay there. And, um, and that's a dangerous place for me because I don't want to be there any longer. Um, cause I don't want to relive my past. That's the most important piece now is I don't want to relive my past. It's the past. I can't change it, but what am I going to do today? How am I going to show up today to, for my future? And so, um, when I'm starting to feel some kind of way, um, I found that being of service to someone else and like supporting them um, has helped me get out of that funk and helped me get out of myself and into a better state of mind. And not only that, it, you know, it's like I show up for the, I show up for my clients every day um, to support them uh, through any of their pain that they've had through their abortions or whatever, you know, whatever's coming up for them. And that for me allows me to get out of my stuff because I've been through this experience and I know what the solution is and I know how to get to the other side. So if I can like hold my hand out to you, I'm going to get emotional, but if I can hold my hand out to you and like bring you over here with me, then that's like so fulfilling for me rather than to see you sit in the pain that I did for so many years. Let me help, let me support you and make this a quicker process than you going through years of your life just sitting there. So what showed me that um, being of service was, was gonna be a solution was, you know, when I went into recovery, it was with a 12 step program. And part of the program is being of service to others and in helping other, other women. And so as I was helping other women, I, and I'm listening to some of their stories and I'm like, wow, so many, cause you always think that you're the only one that's going through this. And um, I'm like, wow, we, some of us, we have, so, we're so much more alike than we are different. And you start to see that everybody has a story. And what's interesting is so many of us keep it a secret and allow, and, and, and it's like, we deal with the pain and suffering in silence. And um, so by me sharing about it, and that's when I really started sharing about it um, within the confines, the confines of like the 12 step program, I would share with the, with some of the women um, because they felt comfortable to share with me part of their story. Um, and then later on, I started working with a coach and, um, by working with her, I was able to like find more of my voice and, you know, be like, be able to just talk about it, like pass the salt. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, it doesn't phase me today before I was so worried about, Oh my God, what will other people think today? I go, okay, how can I go out and impact the world? Like who, who can I support by sharing my story? so that they don't sit in the pain and suffering alone because they're not alone. We never are. So when it came to relationships, yes, you're right. Like I dated the same guy 
um, over and over again, he just had a different face. And so, yeah, it was the same behaviors and, um, the lashing out and the making comments. And so, um, in the midst of it, as it's happening, you know, part of my survival skill is like to have thick skin and have this, like this wall up that it wouldn't, that it wouldn't bother me in that moment. And not that it wouldn't bother me because you could still feel the sting of it, but it didn't set in until later on. Um, later on when, um, usually when I was by myself and then because I never allowed myself to feel feelings, I didn't understand that our body, um, that we carry all of these emotions and stuff in our body and that we get to feel them today. And, and it's okay. Feelings are okay. Um, I had grew, I grew up thinking that feelings weren't okay. It was, that was the sign of weakness. If you, if you felt your feelings and God forbid you cry, then you're really weak. So, um, but yeah, like when I was by myself and the feelings would begin to come up and, um, like I would have this voice in my head that would say, oh, that's, that's not true, but it doesn't make the sting like hurt any less. So it's like the pain is still there, but then I have a choice. Like, do I get engrossed in the pain and go down that rabbit hole? Or do I say, okay, you know, this is just words that are coming out of somebody's mouth and they can't harm me. So what do I believe about me? Because that's ultimately what it's about. It's about the belief within myself of, do I love me? And do I think I'm worthy? And in that moment, I'm going to say, I didn't believe in me. And I didn't think I was worthy because if I did, I wouldn't have been in that relationship. That's the truth. So during my second marriage, um, I had gotten pregnant a couple of times and I had, a, I had miscarriages and I was like, what the hell is happening? So um, I went to the doctor for the second one and he said, Hey, by the way, um, I don't think you're not going to be able to have children. You, um, there's like a lot of scar tissue that's formed and you know, all the things. And I didn't, I don't even remember what he said. All I knew is that he said that I couldn't have children any longer. And I think I want to say I was like 28 or 29 years old or like somewhere in my late twenties or early thirties. And, um, that was devastating. Like I immediately, I had never wanted to have kids before, but when he took that away from me, it was like, what do you mean? Like suddenly all of that stuff came up of, um, but I want this, but did I really, or was it just the fact that some, it was like being taken from me? I felt like it was being ripped out of my fucking heart. Um, I felt like my heart was being ripped out of my chest. Um, and I felt like I wasn't going to be a woman because not only was it about the abortion, but that, that same conversation was, oh, Hey, by the way, you test positive for herpes. So it was like all one conversation where I'm like, whoa, now my self-worth is like completely out the window because I think that, um, like I'm devastated. My life is now over. I can't have children. I test positive for herpes. Holy shit. What else can happen to me? You know what I mean? Like at this point, I feel like I've got hit by a car. Yeah. I shared it with my husband at the time I went home immediately and it, it shared with him, um, you know, that I couldn't have children. And, um, and he was, you know, very, he was amazing about that. Um, you know, and then shared with him about testing positive for herpes and that, you know, that went as good as it possibly could, but, um, you know, dealing with, dealing with those emotions, I, had never dealt with emotions and feelings. And so I did what I always did, which was let, let me go out and get high and drink again, because I, I don't want to feel that. Cause now, um, like my life is really destroyed. And so it doesn't, at this point, there's nothing that can happen to me. That's worse than what's already happening in my mind. That's the, that's the story I wrote. And so I just went out and I, at that point, I just didn't care because I didn't want to feel anything anymore. Yeah. Like actually finding out that I couldn't have children, like sparked my using to a whole, it catapulted it to a whole nother level. You know, um, how I feel about it today, not being able to have children. Um, yeah, I, the emotions have like, it's like been a wave of emotion. Um, I think that that has been the best decision for me based on the life that I was living. Um, because it, it, I don't think there would be any way that I could have 
been able to bring a child into the world, considering how um, insane my life was. So the way that I feel about it now is everything happened the way that it was supposed to happen. And, um, you know, sometimes I feel um, a little sad because of some of the choices that I made. And then I follow that up with, you know, this is who you are today. And had you not made those choices, you wouldn't be who you are. So, you know, what is it? What am I missing? Am I missing something by not having children? No, because if I was, it, it wouldn't be. Do you know what I mean? Everything happened the way that it was supposed to be. Everything turned out the way that it's supposed to be. And if I was meant to have children, then I would have. But apparently I'm not meant to. I feel like I think that there's a much bigger mission for me. <laughs> and so, and that's okay. I'm like, I'm ready for it. Like I'm down for, for anything that's coming up for me now. I think that, you know, the biggest thing that I, that I want to get across is if it's the right decision for you, if, and if it's in your heart that this is what I'm supposed to do, then follow your heart and, and follow the path that you're supposed to follow. And don't be ashamed, especially when you go to the clinic and you see the crazy people outside riding, let them be crazy. It's not a personal thing. That's their shit. And you just go in and make your decision and, and make, choose, choose what's right for you. I think that's the biggest thing is it's always a choice in my life. And there's always a consequence with my choice. And so it's being responsible enough to understand that, okay, there's going to be some consequences. There's going to be some feelings and some emotions that come up and it's my responsibility to, to deal with them and to face them head on rather than running from them. Because when I run from them, um, I'm not facing off and I, everywhere I go, there I am. So if I'm running from them, they're going to be following me throughout my whole life until I face off with them. I think it's about recognizing the emotions that are carried in your body, recognizing where you hold them. Um, you know, a, a lot of things for me was the womb space. I became very disconnected from my body. And so um, it was almost like I had shut down from my, my sensual side, the feminine. And um, because I had shut that down completely, I, I, it was, I was holding a lot of emotions there, but I couldn't identify any of that. And I actually, I started doing work with, um, with a woman to do sensual movement. And to like, get back into that, like, where am I holding these emotions? Where am I holding the shame? And it's recognizing that, that P that's really, really important. That's been really important for me to recognize where I'm holding the emotions and to allow myself to feel the emotions. So when I'm not allowing myself to feel the emotion, um, it just, it continues to build. And then I pay attention to my language because I'm either speaking empowering to myself or disempowering and whatever comes out of my mouth is creation, right? Like I'm creating as I speak and I tell the world who I am every time I open my mouth. So if I have not addressed any of these emotions, I'm carrying them around, it will show up in my speech. At least for me, that is what I have learned. And so as I address the emotions and give myself the time to feel them, and like I schedule time to feel like 15 minutes because my mentor says anything longer than 15 minutes, you're addicted to the feeling. 15 minute timer, cry the shit out. <laughs> and, and I can come back later and do it another time if it comes back up, but it's just moving those emotions and those feelings through my body. And, um, I find that when I, when I started doing that, it shifted the way that I was feeling about myself, which shifted the way I was speaking about myself, which empowered me to show up differently to my life and to my job. So for me, um, I, I used to think that feeling my feelings was, oh my God, let me lay in bed and cry and be sad. The problem with that is I never got out of the laying in bed and crying and being sad. <laughs> and I just stayed in that place. Um, and so today what I do is I give myself permission. You're allowed to be angry. So how do I move that emotion through my body? Well, I like stack up a bunch of pillows and beat the shit out of some pillows. Um, 
I'll, you know, drive in my car and scream at the top of my lungs. But it's like, but whatever I'm doing, I'm moving that energy through my body. And so, and I can feel it release. Like I feel it kind of, it, it will, um, I like feel it leave my body. I can't even describe it any other way. Um, and that's what I mean by allowing myself to feel my feelings. I can get caught up in the sadness and the sorrow and I can sit there, but my biggest thing is don't like feel your feelings, but don't pitch a tent and camp the fuck out there. Do you know what I mean? Because it's like that that's not supportive at all. I'm giving myself permission to move them through my body so that I can move on. I don't want to live in the past today. I can't change the past. So like, let's, let's move on and move towards the future and bigger and better things you know, being at that age and, um, finding yourself pregnant. Yes. That's, um, that's quite challenging, especially if you don't trust your parent or they could be volatile or abusive. And so what I would say in that instance is to find an adult that you do trust and share it with them. Um, because, you know, we always think we, at least for me, I always thought that I knew what to do, but the reality is there's always someone out there that knows more than me and that can assist me and support me through my process and not to think that I'm alone. And so by finding someone that I trust and that begins breaking the shame cycle right there by me sharing, sharing what I'm going through with someone. And that's a challenge because, you know, being, being underage, and going through a situation like being pregnant and sharing it with your parent. And the one thing that I would say is recognize that your parent probably has never had this experience before of being a parent and having their child say, Hey, mom or dad, I'm pregnant. And understand that because they've never had that experience before that they might react. Um, and it's not a personal thing. Um, they just don't know what to do. They're in a, they are in the midst of panic. And just as much as I didn't know what to do, my mother didn't know what to do. And so it was, um, like I look, I can look back now and say, she was freaking the fuck out. She was freaking out. She didn't know what to do. She was just like, oh my God, let me just solve this issue. And this is what we're going to do. And she didn't even think past, oh my God, maybe my daughter needs to talk to somebody. Maybe she needs to have therapy. She just wanted to solve the problem and be done because she had so many other problems and so many other things that she was dealing with at that time. And so I've learned that it's not a personal, it was never a personal thing. Although I was angry at her for a while, it had never been a personal thing. It was just about her working through what she saw as a problem, let me solve the problem and, and then move on. And that's exactly what she did. And it was no big deal. And um, to her, it was no big deal. And to me, it affected me differently. So recognizing that um, there is going to be, um, there are going to be things that I'm, that I get to take responsibility for and understand that, hey, I'm probably going to need some therapy. I'm going to need to talk to somebody. And so knowing that regardless of how my parents show up, I can take that responsibility and that knowledge and go, okay, so I know that however mom and dad are going to show up, I know I need to ask for therapy. And that, I don't know what that looks like. I, I don't know if that looks like going to mom and dad and saying, hey, I need therapy or going to school and say, hey, I need therapy. It doesn't really matter as long as you take that initiative and take the responsibility and say, hey, I know that I'm going to need a little bit of support here because I'm going through this. If I don't use my voice, and this is what happened to me, I didn't use my voice to speak up about the abortion. And so I didn't use my voice to say, hey, I need therapy. And that perpetuated a cycle of not not using my voice in so many other areas of my life. And so I just, all I did was create that cycle where it got to a place when I was an adult that um, I am in a group of people now and I don't feel good enough or like I don't measure up and I'm not smart enough and I can't contribute to the conversation. And it's all about not ever using my voice. And because I never, sh I never showed up. So then 
that played a role in me not showing up in my life in so many other areas because of that. I think so many people do. And it's just like, we don't, we, because we don't know that we can take responsibility because I've already pissed them off enough right now to let them know that I'm pregnant. So God forbid that I say, Hey, I need therapy, but I'm not even, it's like, I don't know any parent that would say, no, I'm, you cannot have therapy. It, like if I show up and say, Hey, mom, dad, I'm hurting They They love me. They, they're, Oh, okay. We don't know you're hurting unless you tell us. Right. So yeah, I think that's really important is just to communicate In my household. We never communicated. I don't even remember my dad, like hugging us and saying, I love you and stuff like that. When I was a kid, I think, you know, the, the biggest thing for me that I'm finding uh, what, what I'm finding out now is there's so many women that have had abortions and they, they keep it a secret. And so I'm finding that the more I speak out about it, the more I'm giving, it's like, I speak out about it. I'm, I give other women permission to speak about it because they go, Oh my God, I'm not alone. And it's insane that we would think that we are alone in this world. I'm the only woman on the planet that's ever had an abortion. I know that's not true. I fucking watch the news. Do you know what I mean? Like, I know it's not true, but in my head, I'll write that story and that will quiet my voice. And I won't want to say anything because, Oh my God, what will people think? And now I'm just kind of like, you know, shot it from the rooftops. Like, I mean, what does it matter what other people think? Hey, what matters for me is that, um, I don't have any secrets anymore because secrets keep us sick and they keep me in that, that mental pattern of, um, like holding back and not showing up to my life because I think I'm not good enough.